Hello and welcome to the Hoover Libraries Science Fiction and Fantasy Fest Folklore and Fiction panel. Um, we are going to spend the next hour talking about folklore and mythology, how you can use it in your fiction, um, what the limits might be if there are any, and I think we're going to have a good time. So I'll start. My name is Patricia Carell and I write fantasy and horror, mostly fantasy. Um, almost everything I write is influenced by folklore. Um, I do a lot of retellings. I do a lot of mythology-based stuff. So this is definitely something that I am into. Um, I will let you guys introduce yourselves. All right, I'm Olivia Wiley. I am a biracial woman from Upper Wisconsin, uh, Menominee Irish, so I grew up in a tale-telling community. And I've expanded that as an adult into nonfiction research into folklore, especially ethnobotany, which is the intersection between plants and human culture, and uh, illustrated work on ancient Irish myth and storytelling. And under the pen name O.E. Tierman, I write a hopeful queer cyberpunk series where I like to draw on folklore and history to create the future. And hi, I'm Mickey Hua, and I write YA and adult fantasy on a sliding scale. Um, uh, I have a BA in East Asian studies, and I kind of got interested in folklore and mythology from a young age because I had teachers that exposed me to Egyptian and Greco-Roman. And from that, I've expanded into, of course, East Asian through my degree. Okay, cool. Um, I will start out by asking what draws you to using it in your work um, and how do you incorporate it into your stories? Like for me, I do a lot of retellings. Um, I tend to like to write stories. Usually in a lot of stories, there's a character who doesn't really get a voice. Um, I just published a book called Juniper Bird and it's based on a Grimm Brothers tale called The Juniper Tree. In it, a stepmother murders her stepson and then makes her daughter believe that she killed him. And so in the actual fairy tale, the daughter never gets a voice. And I always thought that she was the most affected person in the story, obviously. So I wrote the tale from her point of view. Um, I do that quite a bit. Um, so how do you guys like to incorporate it and what draws you to these stories? Well, I'll say what draws it, me to them um, is, I'd say twofold. It, I feel like folklore, is the root that binds me to my history. I grew up with the story of Wendigo as don't be selfish. I grew up with the stories of how my great grandma and my great grandpa met to tell me who I was. I grew up with the stories of the high kings at Tara to teach me what it meant to be an honorable person and take care of people and be a community. But um, I left the Kishana Reservation at about 11 years old, and then we'd only go home in the summers because there's not a lot of work, and my mom was looking to do better for us. And it was the stories that kept me connected, especially as you know I got further away from home and I started reading things like, uh, oh, let's see, Charles DeLint um, was a very formative book for me. Um, because it told me that the magic I'd grown up with could still exist in the modern world, that I didn't have to be a torn apart creature who had one foot in history and one foot in the modern world. And I felt very out of place. So um, the story of the Moor Child was a big one. Ah, was a big one for me. Sorry. Uh, the Moor Child by Eloise McGraw told me that it's okay to be different and you can still be different and chart your own way in life. Um, I like to uh, kind of pick one aspect of different cultures, like areas diverse background, uh, and how I think that there are so many threads in mythology and folklore that put us all together as humans. And I love seeing those connections, like from dragons or from, um, even the search for immortality and how each culture has approached them differently, but we're all searching for the same thing. Uh, so right now in my current work, which its working title is Etched in Glass, uh, I'm exploring kind of that East meets West feel in Hong Kong, oh, no. uh, where the British had 
uh, some uh, had control over it for at least 99 years. Uh, and it's been fun seeing how those kind of connect and thinking about how those people would have dealt with those differences. Mm -hmm. And then of course, adding a fantastical twist to it because I can't tell a straight story. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> It's just no fun. If it's yeah. just your old lived life, it's like, I don't want to tell you about what I had for lunch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if you read about, like, um, if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, um, mm. he really strips down and shows how a lot of mythology and folklore have a lot of the same aspects from all different parts of the world. And I think That's a lot great. of that will really tell you what it is to be human. Yeah. Because we all have these certain things in common, and he can find that just by looking at the stories and picking out the elements that are in common. Um, and um, I always thought that was really interesting. Um, it's also kind of fun to bring it into the modern world and play with it. And do you think there are any limits on how far you can twist myths before they're unrecognizable or does it not matter? Well, I do feel that um, there's a line of due diligence that is owed to the myths. I really hate it in general culture where someone just takes a name that sounds cool and makes their own creature out of it. At that point, make your no, make a new name. You don't get to call it a Wendigo if it's not a Wendigo. You don't get to call it this thing and then do something that doesn't have any rooting in the original myth for it. Um, I'm going to call out Supernatural. I apologize to fans. It is a good show, but um, they really need to up their research game. Um, one episode in particular, um, they had a demon called Sam Hain, and they pronounced it that way the entire episode. <laughs> I speak the Irish language. It takes two minutes to Google it and find out that it's pronounced Salad. Right. And two sa no, not two minutes, two seconds. <laughs> so if you're going to use a myth, the only thing I ask is that you pay basic respect to the myth. And if, you, if the myth isn't working for your thought process, toss it and make something up. But don't say it's the myth and then do your own thing with it. Uh, that kind of a cultural sense. appropriation just doesn't work anymore. <laughs> not with Google, not with, it's easy to check yourself. So if you don't check yourself, you are simply being disrespectful in my mind. That's my little rant. <laughs> Right, and there's been a lot of um, talk lately about cultural appropriation in writing and who is allowed to write what. Um, I don't always agree with what people say, but I think it's definitely an important conversation to have. Mm -hmm. I have written um, European folklore, because obviously I'm European. Um, the, I have also written in Japanese folklore and mythology. Um, I've retold a couple of myths and used some aspects of mythology in one of my YA novels. Um, I do think that you can write outside of your own culture as long as you do your research. I would drop everything if I was writing something just to find the right detail. I spent an hour looking up Japanese crop cycles to make sure that what I said they were harvesting would be harvested at this time of year. Um, you really have to get it in if you know somebody from that culture to read it. That's also definitely a big plus. Yeah, and see what you just said is what matters to me. Um, it's not so much, what I see as appropriation is, oh, that's pretty. I'm grabbing it. If you have done decent research and looked into it and research and done it well, then it's respectful depiction. It's when you just grab it and go, hey, look, I like the way this word looks. Sam Hain, perfect. <laughs> That's culture appropriation. That is head desk, why, no, please put it back <laughs> moment for anybody part of the culture. So I apologize, um, Mickey, go ahead. It's okay. Um, I, just no, I agree. Um, as long as you're sensitive about it, uh, you approach people of that different culture um, and make sure that you're checking your facts along the way and doing the research. And like Patricia said, taking those, even writing one sentence and you think to yourself, wait, would this really happen? And then you spend that hours of research for this one sentence. I think it's yes. totally worth it. Um, I, I think I push kind of boundaries on that, um, where I like to combine the cultures, but I also take kind of that Star Trek approach, um, <laughs> where you could tell if you're part of that culture or you've studied that culture, that that is what it is and it's based on, 
Um, like, for example, they have the Vulcans, which I will say are Japanese. When you look at so many different aspects of them, from their culture to their history, and you can kind of line them up. And I thought that was pretty cool, so I tried to do that. Um, I have a back burner high fantasy novel that I'm working on, and I do plan on putting those cultures together, but again, finding those ties that make them human and seeing, okay, so I'm going to take an aspect from here and I'll take an aspect from there, but I'm not going to say it's straight up from one place. Right. And, and that is hugely valuable. Um, I am the artist on a steampunk webcomic called Parmesan, which um, Parmesan is the Hindi word for legends, and we based it on, uh, one of the main characters is from a culture based on the Romani and the Tuareg. And yeah, you have to be very sensitive when you're writing about these cultures. The other thing you have to do is uh, vet your sources, because like I said, I've been researching the Romani, and a lot of the research that was done on Romani culture was done from a culturally insensitive place. So people who were putting themselves out there, um, for folks who don't know, Romani is the proper term for gypsy. Um, gypsy is actually a racial slur and it's being phased out more and more. So unless somebody says, I call myself a gypsy and they're from that culture, don't use it. Um, ask them, are you Roma or Romani? Anyway, the reason I'm bringing it up is you even have to question the researchers and make sure that they knew what they were talking about. And I have um, some cultural experience with this from both sides of my family. Um, so I'm Menominee Irish, and there's stuff I read from the 70s about the Menominee culture. I grew up on that reservation, and I'm looking at it going, no, no, <laughs> that, no, that's not what it is. Um, and you can tell it was written by someone with a European lineage who was just kind of looking at it and going, this would make an interesting paper. And you see the same thing a little earlier in research done in the 1920s on Irish culture. Um, you even see it in some of Yeats's work where he was very obviously saying, and now I shall visit the, the common abode of a small tenant farmer and I will write down their stories. And um, he thought he was being charming and he was actually being pretty disrespectful. So be careful of your sourcing is, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. There's such a wealth of information out there, but you don't know who's got it right. <laughs> yeah, and you really, you have to um, sift through. I mean, Google's a great jumping off point, but you have to go from each source. I'll tell you, I actually like to start at Wikipedia and work my way through their references because the more you read, the more you start going, oh, this source says that source is a piece of crap, and this other good source says that source is a piece of crap. If four different good sources say don't read the other thing, don't read the other thing. Everyone in a, in a community of research will know who's good and who's bad, so you just have to read lots on each topic to get a sense. Because like you guys said, you don't know what you don't know when you're stepping into a new culture. So you just have to read everything until you've got a stronger sense of what's solid and what's not. And when I was reading about Romani culture, I started off with, you know, in the life of a Romani gypsy, which is a old, not good book from the twenties and worked my way up. And there's no shame in starting from a place of learning and working towards a place of knowledge. That is the work of the storyteller to go from beginner to storyteller. Just don't stop at beginner and say you're knowledgeable. I guess that's kind of my attitude. Right, and things looking up and, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, it's okay. Um, I also think it's important to consider the history when you're looking at these cultures and myths, because uh, you have to know where it came from and why yeah. that people might have thought this way. Yes. Because um, I find that a lot of times when I'm reading something, especially, so I'm, major concentration in Japanese and I'll read a book that supposedly takes place in Japan or has um, Japanese cultures but they're really not the culture but the pop culture yes uh, and, and it's like well they really want to do that and I find a lot of things they do are disrespectful where they talk about one thing and they're like but I'm not going to do that because I'm an independent person 
but you have to understand that that's the culture and that you need to work in the parameters of that world. Mm -hmm. so. uh, Patricia, do you, I don't want to monopolize, so if you no, want to go next. <laughs> No, um, I was going to say that also one of the problems with research is a lot of the times threads get really tangled up and it's hard to pick it apart. Um, yes. I'm working on something now that is, has a lot of Celtic mythology elements. And oh boy. there are so many different gods. There are writings by the Romans who obviously aren't a good source to, they have definitely biased and <laughs> the agenda. Um, and there are just so many different sources. The Celts had no written language, so there's nothing directly from them. And you have to pick apart how you want to present it and who, what aspects you want to use and what mm -hmm. you think might be the most accurate. And that yes. can take a lot of work. <laughs> yes, I, I deeply sympathize on that. Um, I'm going to show on the screen a book that I've done recently called The Triads of Ireland. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, come on, come on. Behave yourself. Yeah. Okay, so it's not behaving, but um, it's an illustrated volume of uh, poems that were used by the judges to the, called the Breton to help in decision deciding how to arbitrate law, and it's Im extremely important to understand first that these were oral poems memorized and passed down orally, and they were only written down in the ninth century, translate, or retranslated re in the 12th century, and then translated by a German guy in 1906 into English. <laughs> so you really get a sense of how, um, how diluted it can be and how much you have to put in the work to understand what's being talked about from each of those points of view in order to get the meaning. Um, and before Kuno Meyer translated the triads, someone else had translated them and had tried to take these poems, which in their true form, in their old Irish form, they look more like haiku to a Western trained eye than they do any other Western form. Um, and this other translator, Clancy, had tried to turn them into Victorian poems and Oh my God, it was awful. It was horrible. <laughs> and Kuno Meyer came back in and looked at it and said, what are you doing, Clancy? That's not the shape of the poems at all. And no, we're redoing this. And so we got closest as we can to the original meaning through the eyes of someone who said, no, I don't want it to look like my culture. I want it to look like its culture. Um, and that takes a lot of, of self-knowledge to say, I want to find not my truth in this work, but its truth in the work. So yeah, trying to reach back into that. But like you said, Patricia, trying to pull apart, tease apart all of these layers, because you've got the pre-Christian um, in um, Old Celtic, and then you've got the Anglo-Saxon layered over that, and then you've got the Christian layered over that, and then <laughs> peeling onion layers, and at a certain point you've got no more onion left, and you're like, okay then. It does but I think for, um, I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'm just saying it's important to be intellectually honest about that, so yeah. It does offer a certain amount of freedom because most readers aren't going to know, but you do. <laughs> yeah, and it can also offer um, some room for play mm -hmm. as an author because um, one of the things that I see really well done in the old series Border Town, which I counted as one of the books that saved me in high school, it's a, a fantasy that, but it's extremely well rooted in mythology, is um, the fact that the elves in the series will say, well, you humans never got it actually right. So <laughs> you wrote it down like this. This is how it actually works. And it gives great room for play as you're writing. Um, you don't have to ignore all the information or all the mythology. You just, if you really want to bend it, you can say, you humans, you never got it right. And do your own thing. Yeah. And, um... I've been reading a lot of, I have two kids, so I've been reading a lot of middle grade books, and I've been seeing a lot of fantasy based in folklore that is non-Western, which is really, really nice to see. Um, I just read with my son, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, which combines oh, nice. um, African 
tribal mythology um, from different places and also American folklore, um, tall tales like um, John Henry and Br'er Rabbit. Oh yeah. I thought it was really beautifully done. I learned a lot. I knew a lot of the stories, but not all of them. And um, I'm seeing that a lot more. I think Rick Riordan kind of spearheaded this. Um, he actually mm -hmm. produces these books that are written in mythologies that he doesn't write in because he sticks to Greek, Roman, Egyptian. Right. But he's also helping promote these other authors with different ideas. Right. So I think that's really great. Who do you all think is getting it right besides y'all? <laughs> Well, I've got two. Um, I would say, first of all, Matthew Borenson is writing, the first book he writes is The Girl with Ghost Eyes, and the second book is The Girl with No Face. And it's a series about a, I was going to try and pronounce it, I'm not going to get it right, so I'm not going to try, a um, Taoist magician. Um, and I keep hearing the word in the audiobook, and then I tried to put it on my tongue and said, no, you're going to get it wrong. But she is a Taoist music magician and she is living in Chinatown in the 19 teens as Chinatown is going through all of its upheavals in San Francisco. And she's talking about traditional um, magic, traditional Asian magic. And it's really interesting because it's in the milieu of being, figuring out where you are. Are you American? Are you from this culture? Are you from that culture? Where do you belong? And where does your magic belong? And the magic she grew up with running into the magic of the land that she's on. It's fascinating. And um, I'll always shout out Anansi Voice by uh, uh, not Neil Gaiman, because it's one of the wittiest, cleverest, sweetest, most awesome re representations of magic and family and um parent and fatherhood um out there and it's um, playing with the idea that the god anansi has children regularly in the in the world and he lives forever so but his kids don't but they usually have god powers and so he, he has these tricksy young kids and then they have to fix their dad messes and it's a wonderful book I just put that on my list. I'm not a huge Neil Gaiman fan usually, but um, this one's much more playful. Though. Yeah, this one's a lot more playful and a lot less dark than most of his other work. Some of his work is very, very dark. This one is more earth and blood and bone of the land, but not so much the horror aspect. Right, and a lot of what I'm seeing is um, books for kids. And like I said, and that's awesome because we didn't have books set in non-Western mythologies when I was a kid in the 80s. And yeah. so my sons can read these and learn all about different places in the world and what they believe and how what they have in common with us. And I think yeah. that's just fantastic. Mickey, did you have any in mind? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really pinpoint particular ones. I just like stories that really incorporate their own versions of myths and magic that they've drawn inspiration from. Like I'm currently on the last book for um, A Conjuring of Light for the Darker Shade of Magic series by B.E. Schwab. Mm -hmm. And I like how she's incorporated uh, POCs into all of this lore of her own story. And she did it in such an organic way where I don't think it's so in your face unless you're actually looking for it. Um, and I like that it's subtle and you learn something in the end and then you would look back and think, oh, okay. So this is actually a story from this point of view um, and various points of view because she has also, of course, Caucasian characters. Um, but I like the way that she did that, so. Well, um, also shout out um, Robin McKinley, who does um, a lot of European fairy tale rewrites. Um, Deerskin is really good. It takes an old French fairy tale that has some really dark implications and just kind of runs with it. Yeah. If you're interested in that, um, Robin McKinley is a good one. And I'll also, again, shout out, um, uh, sorry, my kitten's howling, uh, Charles DeLint, who is really good at weaving old old ways of being into modern ways of being. So you get a sense of a rooted world that is growing into something new. And 
for any 80s babies or 80s fans, Welcome to Border Town is a lifesaver book. It's about this city that grows up. There's a rift where fairyland starts to connect to the human world again. And there's a city that's like a Rust Belt city in the middle of the rift. So it's not really human. It's not really elven. It's stuck in the middle. And it's where all the runaways, all the wild kids, all the people who don't belong somewhere else from both worlds end up and mix and match and interact in you know rock music and just trying to get by and making it work and there's a lot of power in it because it is gritty and it is very real and it feels like they know what it means to not be able to pay the rent at the end of the week but at the same time there's magic and sometimes I think people can lose their connection with the folk tales when they're worried about paying the rent. But if you know the tales well, you know their tales of survival and um, overcoming, they're not just, how do I phrase this? They're not Victorian fairies floating around on pretty little wings. These are stories of blood and bone and strength and survival. And they'll get you through the dark days if you pay attention to them and if you're listening. And that's what I told my son when we read um, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. A lot of the bad guys and what is happening in this magical world echoes American slavery. And yeah. the people who are out to save everyone are Br'er Rabbit, John Henry, Hi John, um, their stories. Hi John de Cantier. That's awesome. Yeah, that was the one that was one I'd never heard of. So I did some research on him after we read it. So that was really fun. Well, and this is one. Yeah, and this is another thing that I love from different cultures is that if you're paying attention and if you read carefully and, pay, and are looking for it, you will notice gods in disguise everywhere. John de Conquer is a great example. And he just pulled the cloak of Americana over himself, but he is one of the old African Orisha. And if you're paying attention, um, St. Bridget the Bright is Bri, the goddess of light. And I love the idea that this interacts with the concept that um, conservation of mass, we never lose something, it just changes. Mm -hmm. And that's true in our magic and in our gods and our spirits as well. We never lose them totally. They just shift for the times and the places and become something new when the people need something new. So they haven't forgotten us. They've just taken a new shape. I like that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I like, that, I like that that goes kind of with um, animism and like, I got really into the Shinto aspect of things where everything has a soul. Yeah. And uh, Romans also believed that. And I think that's, a fun way to look at it, um, where you're looking at all these different points of view. Uh, I, I also teach, so whenever I have an assignment and it says, please read any book from the shelf, and I will look for those cultural books. Like, we read this really adorable picture book um, about Ganesh. Oh, yeah. The Hindu god, yeah, and uh, how he had this love of cupcakes, and that's how he ended up losing his tusk, and I thought that was just such a fun way to incorporate that into young lives so that maybe they'd be interested enough to look into it on their own. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of power. I mean, we pick on Disney a lot, for good reason in many cases. But they're doing better, <laughs> and movies like Moana um, give kids the encouragement to say, that culture's really cool, I want to look into it. Not just, oh, that's different. <laughs> um, now, I will give the caveat that I grew up on a reservation and old oh, Pocahontas. And the conversation starts with, um, if you'd ever been to these woods, you wouldn't go around without something on your legs. Because <laughs> the northwestern woods will, or excuse me, the northeastern woods are full of brambles and they will cut you open. And the traditional Menominee and Potawatomi and Ojibwe dress all includes um, trousers or wraps up your legs all the way to the top because you'll get cut open otherwise. So every time we watch that movie, it's like, uh-huh, all right. <laughs> um, 
But that said, at the same time, it was, hey, look, finally, there's a character that makes people look at us as not the enemy, as the good guys. So kind of a step in the right direction, kind of. And I, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking as someone mixed race. So I'm not speaking for the Menominee Nation. It's just my own experience growing up watching movies with my cousins and going, oh, God. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's a step in the right direction. And those stories can change the way people look at each other as, oh, you're strange, you're the enemy, or, oh, you're my neighbor. You're someone I recognize from this movie or someone I know. And that's huge in our culture to, to create that sense of inclusion the first step is teaching kids that nobody is a stranger. They're just someone you haven't met yet. I think that's important because like it opens the conversation up. For example, like I saw Mulan, of course, when it came out. And I was all excited because there's finally somebody who looked like me. Yeah. Um, and then my family pointed out, well, that wouldn't happen that's over the top. And I was like, <laughs> you mean there cool. aren't little dragons that like I can put on my shoulder and they'll tell me what to do, but <laughs> <Winning>. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, but you kind of got it wrong every time, so maybe this is yeah. a good thing. <laughs> but I, I think it, it does open important conversations. And I, I was actually talking to my cousins about this yesterday, so it was really interesting to see what yeah. their point of view. Yeah, and it's step one, because once Disney opened up, you know, with with Mulan or with Pocahontas, then the next person who made a piece, like right now there's a great um, group called uh, Native Realities Press, who's putting out comics made by indigenous folks with indigenous stories. But the big groups opened that up because before that these works were still being made but they didn't get any publicity. And um, another great example is um, movies like The Song of the Sea. Um, and movies like The Secret of Kells. Irish animation is picking up where the big companies have fallen off and they're telling these stories of Selkies and these stories of magic and the Book of Kells in a way that's relevant to kids today. So it's not just, oh, grandma tells these stories, but hey, I love that movie. And that means so much because the stories are still alive. And I think as storytellers, our job is to dig down deep into that old myth and that old meaning and find the bits that we can. Uh, so my symbol is the otter um, from both sides of my culture. So I picture an otter diving deep and finding the shiny rocks and pulling them back up to the surface to show everybody, look at, look at, look at. <laughs> um, so uh, for the one I showed you earlier, the triads, I had to go through uh, not well scanned in copies of a 1906 manuscript. So it involved a lot of, can I make the screen bigger? And um, squinting at the screen and fighting to get through this awful translation of an older translation of an older translation. But my hope is that I've produced a book that allows people to see these stories new. And um, I have another book out, um, uh, it's called Roots Insights. Um, yeah, it's not going to behave. It's uh, Roots Insights from the Tree Alphabet of Old Ireland, where I'm going through the Elwam, which is the Irish alphabet. That's a loose term, um, but it was an Irish writing system. And each letter is connected to a concept and a tree. And so I'm linking, why did the culture feel this way about this tree? And it's not, I'm fight, I'm using this to both connect people back to the, the vitality of these stories. And also, I'm gonna sound awful here, but to kind of fight the tendency of, of neo-pagans to, to think everything is fluffy. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> but, um, our ancestors were very practical people. So when they saw a tree that got cut go from white to red, they made a very deep connection with, this is the tree of warriors, this is the tree of bloodshed. It didn't have anything to do with mysticism or looking fancy. It was, I know this tree, I grew up with this tree, I understand this tree. 
So I will use its mark to say, I want to learn more or I want to be protected. I want to bring back the vitality of these stories, but also the practicality of them. There's nothing, how do I say it? There's nothing pretentious about it. It is earth and blood and bone and making sure the crops grow. And I think that's kind of true around the world. It's make sure the ki kids don't drown down beside the river and talk to them about Jenny Green Teeth. Make sure the crops grow, offer food, make sure things work out, call on the ancestors. And I think sometimes we get away from the fact that this was not fanciful for the people who were telling these stories. This was truth and blood and bone. Right. I mean, you can watch the Disney princess movies and think oh, these are nice. And then you read the original fairy tales and you realize that they were cautionary tales. Yeah. You don't go off with a stranger in the woods. <laughs> yeah. That's where don't sign up. Yeah. Don't sign up to get married before you've got the guy. Right. <laughs> All the all these stories, I mean, uh, but some of them were also encouraging tales. Like um, one of my favorites is um, I Myself, where this little girl is being um, harassed by a fairy and he's threatening to call all of his relatives down on her and eat her. And he's like, you know, what's your name? What's your name? And she's like, I Myself. And so when all of his relatives come in, they're like, who did this to you? Myself did this to me. Myself did this to me. And then, so it's encouraging kids, think on your feet, stay calm, think it through, and you'll be fine. It's encouraging us to have a sense of agency, you know. A, a lot of these stories, some of them are, well, if you're dumb, you die. But a lot of them are, okay, you're in a bad situation, be brave, think it through, work it out, go forward. And, um, I think it was Gamian, but I might be wrong, said it best that um, we don't tell stories of knights beating dragons so that kids think they'll be knights, but that they know dragons can be beaten. Because right. we're going to beat dragons in life, and we need stories that tell us, okay, I can beat this, I can do this. Because if we don't have that, we just despair. Right. Yeah, I think people can overcome it, so can you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And also, um, for it depends on what you're using stories for, but they can mean a whole lot. I'm going to give a little personal anecdote. Um, I, like I said, I'm mixed race. And as a kid, I have real problems with that because I felt like I didn't fit anywhere. But my Menominee name is Otter. And in Irish culture, the Otter is the animal that brought knowledge into the world was the first creature to eat the salmon of wisdom and the salmon was silent it knew everything but it never spoke and the otter ate the salmon came out of the water turned himself into a man because he'd learned shape-shifting from the salmon and went around and became the first storyteller and so that story to me it was it doesn't matter where i am i am still the otter i am still myself and that story, when I was 12, pulled me together and got me past feeling like I didn't belong anywhere. And so a, a, the right story can heal you. And sometimes I think, I don't wanna get too political here, um, but sometimes I think part of the problem we have right now is that we're telling ourselves the wrong stories and we're getting sick from it. Um, because real world isn't tell isn't acting like the stories tell us it should and uh, when a culture lies to itself it gets sick and we need as storytellers we need to reach back into those older stories and start telling our people true stories again and until we do that we're going to be sick in our spirits because we need those true stories again I think I agree also with the because what you're talking about is kind of finding your identity through the stories that you read and the ones that you tell yeah. and I love that the industry is kind of changing where we're getting stories like The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang and Descendant of the Crane by Joan Hitt and like they are telling stories from different perspectives of these marginalized voices and which is what I'm striving to do in my own book um, because there are so many aspects that people don't know and that we as a culture um, 
will lose not only as you know being Asian or Caucasian, but in general, you know. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot to learn from reading stories from the perspectives of the people who experience that. Yeah. And um, there was a TED talk, and I can't remember who it was. It was an anthropologist. Um, his entire TED talk was basically positing that humans became the dominant species because we are able to convey information that is neither a physical nor biological reality. Yes. Think of his name. <laughs> of course I can't, but it's as a TED talk. And um, so yeah, stories are really the bedrock of what makes us human. There are no other animals that we know of that tell each other something that is a fiction, but that also exposes a truth. Yeah. and. I think there is a difference between fact and truth sometimes, that you need to know your facts, you need to know your science, but you can believe in a deeper truth. And there are truths that are hard to put into scientific terms right now because we don't have the science yet. Mm -hmm. I think Diane Duane is probably my favorite writer for understanding both science and myth at the same time she weaves her magic so beautifully because she talks about the fact that all these old myths are cultural understandings of string theory and what was going on with with magic which she terms as wizardry and you know magic so her characters start at like 10 and work up until seniors in high school which is great because the kids get to grow up with the stories as they age in um, but one of her characters, Nita, kind of snorts at her father as she's teaching him that she's a wizard. And it's like, Dad, magic is when you pull a rabbit out of a hat. Wizardry is pulling the strings that hold the universe together. And I just loved the, both the deep myth that she works into her work and the snark. Like, the, you could so see a normal teenager just going, Dad, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so you want perfect. to be a wizard? Is that the book? Yeah, so you want to be a wizard is the first one. And she just recently in the last couple of years came out with the last book, which is Games Wizards Play. Okay. And this for me was what Harry Potter is for a lot of other kids. This was, I started reading it when I was the age of the protagonists in So You Want to Be a Wizard and aged up. And so I'm in my mid thirties and the last book just came out where the main characters are now mentors and teachers. And I'm reading it just going, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, those, those stories have a lot of power. Um, I've been trying to work with that more. Uh, right now, there is um, a bit of a mental health crisis on the Kishana Reservation. There has been for about a decade. So I'm working with an artist to create a comic book based in Menominee myth on the we have a spirit called the Anamahihu, which is an evil spirit. It, um, it sinks its claws into you when you're in a moment of weakness and it feeds on human suffering. So the whole point of this as a cultural concept is how to end suffering as a community, um, how to help someone kill their Anamahihu. And the only way you can kill one is by starving it, which means ending that person's suffering so that the Anamahihu starves. So we're telling this story about how to improve mental health for young people, how to work through discord among young people so that they can heal their own traumas and their own problems in a healthy way. And we're, we're dealing with it in terms of the mythology of the Mesomachaic, which are the spirits of, of the clans of the Menominee, the spirits of order, the spirits of everything being the way it should fighting the anima kiku and drafting in this young human girl and saying, hey, we're going to give you our powers. And of course, her response is, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> so it's, it's a fun project, and I can't wait to get it out because um, we need to teach our young people in a way that isn't preachy, in a way that isn't, well, you need to work on your mental health, but it is termed in culture, in story hey, here are our tools, here are ways to help yourself, here are ways to help your people. Because until we're all healthy, all of us are gonna have a problem. 
All right, we are coming up on about 50 minutes so far, so um, I think we should probably start wrapping it up. Um, we'll go through again, and if you guys just want to give me your name again and tell me where we can find you. Um, I'm Patricia Carell. I write fantasy, and you can find my stuff on Amazon. Um, I am also on Twitter at author underscore P Carell. If you have any questions about this panel that you would like to direct me, please feel free to do so. Uh, Mickey, do you want to go next? Or uh, So I'm Mickey Hua, and you can find me on Twitter. Right now I'm working on my first novel that I hope to be querying soon. Um, and that handle is at Mickey Hua Writes. So it's M-I-K-I-H-U-A and then Writes. And I am Olivia Wiley. That's W-Y-L-I-E. And I, you can find me in a couple of places. Um, my business page is Leafing Out Professional Gardening. Just type Leafing Out into Facebook. I'm mostly on Facebook. Um, or uh, www.leafingoutgardening.com. Um, the shop page will take you to all my books. Um, I write for the Brehan Law Academy. So Brehan, B-R-E-H-O-N. Um, on Facebook and let's see oh and I have an Etsy page where all the books and uh, I do card decks for all this all the plant related stuff um, and that's just uh, leafing out again um, and then everything's up on Amazon under my name so yeah um, and I hope people keep telling your story all right. Thank you guys for participating. It was a lot of fun. And thank you, everybody who was watching. Have a good con.